Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please tickle that subscribe button and don't forget the notification bell. You want to set that one to on so you'll be reminded of every time I upload, which tends to be daily. Also, if you're interested in becoming a member or gifting me a coffee as a special thank you, that info can be found in the description. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Terrifying Haunted House Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, I almost forgot. Some of these stories contain adult language used very frequently. If you do not like that sort of thing, this will not be the video for you. Listener discretion is advised. House sitting and taking care of the dogs for my aunt. It was an old farmhouse. Old as in the kitchen and bathroom were added on to the house. Once working plumbing became a common thing. I played some video games, watched a little TV, just winding down to go to sleep. Just laying there in the dark, trying, starting to doze off. And I hear something. Something coming from upstairs. The upstairs was an attic turned into bedrooms for my cousins. The best way I could describe it was like a pipe or a bottle. The sound of some kind of hollow object rolling back and forth across the floor in the room directly above me. I just sat there wide-eyed and scared shitless. Finally, I worked up the courage to go up and turn the lights back on. The rolling sound continued. I told myself it was just something in the walls, trying to come up with any rational explanation. I got up to turn the TV back on and just kind of drowned out the sound. With the lights on, I decided the dogs, two big Wattrylers, were sitting silently in the kitchen, hair bristling and staring right at me. I backed away, honestly afraid that they were going to attack me for some reason. But I realized they weren't staring at me. They were looking past me at the door that goes upstairs. Well, shit. That did nothing to settle my nerves, but there was no way in hell I was going up to investigate. I cranked up the TV, eventually coaxed the dogs into the living room, and after a while I was tired again. I left the TV on, just turned it down, laid back on the couch, and got some shut-eye. I don't know how long I was asleep, just that when I woke up, it was still pitch black outside. What woke me up was the door. My feet were hanging over the arm of the couch. I was sleeping on and the door that led upstairs had come open and hit my feet. If you've ever lived in an old house, you will know this kind of door. It's an old door. The kind that's been warped from too many winters and rubs the frame when you shut it. The kind you would have to put your shoulder into just to close it all the way, and would have to pull really hard to open it again. Yet, there it was, wide open to a pitch black staircase, the hinges creaking as it bumped up against my dangling feet. I was up and out in seconds, the dogs right behind me. I put my shoes on in the car, put the dogs in their kennel, and was off to sweet, sweet civilization. I didn't care about using all the gas to drive out and feed the dogs every day. I wasn't spending another night in that house. I was visited almost every night by what I thought at the time was my deceased sister from the ages of 11 to 16. I don't believe in the supernatural, and I never have, but things happened to me that, honestly, I could not explain, neither at the time nor now. It wasn't my sister. 
I don't know what the fuck it was, but to this day, I seriously doubt that my sister would be sexually and physically assaulting me. I saw it one time when I was 16. I was lying in bed, not asleep, just staring out my bedroom window because I couldn't bring myself to feel tired at all. I remember it was around 1.30 in the morning, and I'd gotten into a fight with my mother, coincidentally about staying up all night when I had school the next day. Earlier, so when I heard my door open, I immediately laid down and acted like I was asleep. So I hear the familiar cracking on her toes as she's walking towards my bed. Her toes pop whenever she walks. I can hear her coming from across the house. And I'm just laying there pretending like I'm not awake. I heard her voice and it was a rushed low whispering. And it wasn't until she was standing almost directly over me that I could hear what she was frantically whispering. My name over and over and over and over and over again. I remember my heart was pounding in my chest because she's close enough to me that I can smell her and she doesn't smell like anything I've ever encountered before. It was like a mixture of rotten ground after a rainstorm and dead fish left in the sun for a week. I opened my eyes and I could see her illuminated in the moonlight from my window. It wasn't my mother. What was lording over me was a woman that stood a little less than six feet tall with stringy and disgusting black hair that fell a little bit over her shoulders. I remember that the most horrifying things about her were that, aside from a disgustingly grime-covered sheer white dress, she was completely naked. I could see the dark points of her nipples through the material and... I'm assuming she wasn't wearing any underwear. Her exposed skin was diseased looking, extremely frail and thin, but it looked tight and a network of black veins stretched against it from underneath. She was white, but honestly, she was more of an off green, like an egg that went bad. God, her eyes. Her eyes were the most horrifying things I have ever seen still to this day. A perfectly smooth face, no nose, no lips, no ears, just eyes. Eyes that were four times too large and perfectly round. Eyes that had no white, had no color, that were just solid jet black. The skin around those spherical nightmare windows was crinkled and crusted with flakes of something that looked black, but could have easily just been red dirt or brown. It was moonlight, not the best to see color. She had fucking bug eyes, man, and they were hovering a half of a foot away from my face. I couldn't fucking move. My body was stuck in Jesus fucking Christ mode, and I couldn't even breathe through my terror. She bent over me and knelt onto my bed, and I felt the pressure. I fucking felt the bed move as she rested her knees on either side of my waist because, of course, she was fucking straddling me. Why wouldn't this nightmare be straddling me? She lowered her face down to mine and touched her forehead to mine. And where the contact happened, I felt my skin burn like I was getting a Tyler Durden-like kiss. I still couldn't move and I still couldn't breathe. I knew that if I opened my mouth, This, whatever the fuck it was, because I don't think it was ever human, was going to tear out my soul and fucking, I don't know, fuck it or something. Oh yeah, did I mention that the entire time this was going on, she was grinding on my lap? The only sound in the room was the sound of my brain shrieking and the subtle shuffle of my bedding as this fucking monster was frantically rubbing its crotch against mine. All I could see was its eyes, filling up my entire vision. All I could smell was its filthy fucking hair as it brushed against the side of my face, and a more subtle, more terrifying smell of arousal as it enjoyed what it was doing to me. I got a surge of strength back in me 
and I rolled to the side, trying to knock this thing off of me because I thought that maybe if I could get it off, I could run. My bedroom had a door that led to the backyard in it, and maybe I could get out of there and just run and never look back. Nope, it clings to me. And now I've got this withering she-beast dragging its dirty fucking fingernails, although they felt like fucking knives, into my back, sides, and arms. As it is, I swear to God, getting off on me. The paralysis sets back in, and I think it was then that I realized that as long as this thing was making eye contact with me, I couldn't fucking move. I tried to close my eyes, but it wouldn't work. I tried to shift my vision away, but her forehead was touching mine, and that was all I could literally see was the black pools of her own fucked up eyes. I pissed myself in fear. I felt her hand reaching from across my back to my chest up to my throat, where it grips me tightly behind the neck and holds me with more force than anything has ever held me before. It removes its face from directly in front of mine, and it's dragging its fetid fucking hair in my face. I feel it press the smooth, tight skin of its own featureless face against my neck. I feel something shift around my neck, like a swarm of flies pressing against my skin. Something wet and very cold touches me, and I realize that this thing just formed a mouth and is fucking licking me. Where it touches, burns like the devil, and now I'm not moving because I'm terrified that if I do, it will use its newfound mouth to tear my throat out. Something sharp grazes my neck, and I try not to think about razor blades. There's a not entirely unpleasant sensation of sucking on my neck, and to my horror, my little Johnson starts to stir. This spurs on whatever the fuck this thing is, and the grinding starts up again. I feel its other hand, Terry furrow from my back down to my waist of my pajama pants where it slips under and starts to shift from the back of my waist to the front. I realize that this thing is reaching for my genitals and summoning whatever surge of adrenaline I had left in me. I bring my knee up between our bodies and I kick as hard as I fucking can. Something sharp tears into my neck, but it's too late. And despite its scrambling hands and tearing nails, I boot this fucking thing off of me and off of my bed. Thud. I immediately hole assed my closet, where I kept my machete that I used to clear brush. Had an overgrown backyard. It was clumsy, but really, all I did was throw myself, with as much force as I could, off the end of the bed, because my closet was right there. Machete out. I turn around, hauling my arm back because I'm going to fucking destroy this thing and there's nothing there. I turn the light on after a serious internal pet talk. I grab the mattress futon and tear it off the lattice metal frame. Machete poised to strike at the thing that must have scuttled underneath it. Nothing. At this point, I'm telling myself that I just had the worst fucking nightmare in the world and that I have pissed myself and should probably shower. I grab another set of PJs and stagger into the bathroom, leaving the machete in the room, although with great reluctance. I am bleeding. A lot. My neck had a gash in it, about three inches long, right where the shoulder and neck meet, curving around to the back. My forehead had a red splotch on it, and the skin is peeling back, like a bad sunburn. I turned around and survey the horror scene that is my back. Trenches have been carved, and there is fucking blood everywhere. My back, my sides, my hips. Thank God I kicked this bitch off of me before she made it down to my nether regions. The crotch of my pajama pants is covered in this awful stain that smells like a mixture of blood, sweat, and death. 
a shower with the curtain open. I turn on the kitchen light. I turn on the library light, the living room light. And then when I get to my bedroom, I open the door and immediately turned on the bedroom light. Still empty. Although now that I know what to look for, I see splatters of blood on my red quilt on my bed. The room smells like a grave. I did not sleep that night, or the night after that, or the night after that. I told a select few people, but nobody believed me. Even when I showed them how this thing turned my back and neck into a connect the dots with its nails. Everybody said I must have done those to myself in my sleep, but some of these marks were in spots that I straight up could not reach myself. I still feel something sit down next to me when I'm laying in bed, but I'll open my eyes and nothing will be there. I don't sleep more than four hours a night, and that's usually broken up into segments. I sleep better in other people's home than I do in my own. It's been a few years since I've encountered it, and I only ever saw it that one time. But because that it started when I was 11, I don't think time is really a factor for whatever this fucking thing is. And I'm convinced that one day it will come back. And the last thing I ever see will be those eyes filling up my vision as it presses its forehead against my own. I wished I could say that this is some horror story that I made up. I really do. I don't believe in the supernatural, but that doesn't mean that this didn't happen. Or whatever that thing was isn't real. I was born for this, literally. When I was born, my family lived in an older house. I'm British, so when I say old, I mean very old. When I was a kid, a young girl used to look after me in my bed. She would always come and look down at me and smile. One night, I was trying to sleep, but she kept poking me and pushing me. I was very young, so it made me cry. My parents were pissed off by it and came into my room and took my bed downstairs and put me down there, hoping I would give up crying and go to sleep. When my dad left the room, she came back and kept on prodding me again and I started crying again. After a little while, my dad came down and just before he came into the room, she smiled again and left. When my father came into the room, he says there was smoke coming from the floor and he ran everyone out of the house. Turns out, there was an electrical fault under the floor, and the house almost caught fire. A little later on, my father was up a ladder fixing something on the side of the old house. The ladder fell over, and he broke his leg. To this day, he claimed something hit that ladder. Whenever anyone went into the loft, it felt cold and You felt like someone was watching you. The final straw was when my mother woke up in the middle of the night and set up to see a young girl looking at her. I think it was the same girl who used to look down at me. My mother felt that this was a warning from her and that we needed to leave. We did that morning. The next day, the top floor collapsed into the lower floor, almost destroying the house. I've never been sure if that girl was looking out for me or attacking me. But bad things only ever happened to me, my brother, and my dad. Never my mother. After we left, the next family to move in had a son. He was born brain damaged. Take from that what you will. About 10 years later, my father died for about 10 minutes from a blood clot. I asked him about it afterwards, and he felt like he was lying on the ceiling looking down at himself. He decided it was not the right night to die and decided to live. For a couple of years afterwards, strange things happened to him. He was driving down an A road for those who have ever been to England. These are fast roads, 60 miles per hour speed limit, but not motorways. They tend to meander and have 
roads join them in odd places. As we were driving down the road, my father looked up at a car coming on from a road to the right and said, I need to stop. He pulled to a stop, but the other car didn't. It careened straight across the road over the small embankment on the other side. If my father had not stopped, ugh, I shudder at the thought. The car would have hit the side I was sitting on killing me and him for sure. Afterwards, he just said that he heard someone saying he needed to stop. Let's go on a few years, skipping some minor events and going to the next big one. I went to grammar school in a crazy school that was converted from an old hospital. The library was the old chapel. The art room was an old ward room. The classrooms were converted from offices and odd labs. It was a crazy place. I was playing rugby after school and had a minor injury when another player accidentally stamped on my head. School had already left after the nurse said I was okay to leave and called my father, him again, to come and get me. I went outside to wait for him at the main gate. As I waited, a taxi pulled up and the driver yelled, Taxi for Big Stony." I thought, lazy son of a bitch sent a cab instead of coming himself. Well, I got in and went home. I got there and no one was home. I was a little confused but sat down to wait for my parents to get home. After about 30 minutes, the phone rang. It was my school and everyone, including my father, was searching the grounds looking for me. There was no other big stonies in my school and my father did not call a cab. Strange. Possibly a coincidence. On the way home, my father was delayed in traffic where two cars had crashed 20 minutes earlier, just when we would have been driving home. I'm sure all of these things had logical explanations, but they freaked me out at the same time. I don't know if I believe in ghosts in the most widely accepted terms, but I'm sure there are things out there which science has yet to discover. When I was about eight, I was going to bed in my room when a gray thing about the size of a football slowly moved across the foot of my bed, slightly pulling the blankets as it went. It dipped down when it got to the end, and I couldn't find any trace of it. We had cats, but my door was always closed, and none were in my room at that time. My parents wouldn't believe me. I can't say I would have if it were just one of my kids. And I was terrified for ages. In the same room as the previous event, I had a door which opened to a screen porch type thing. There was no other way to get into it, as it was locked many times from the inside at the other exit. Every so often, the door would make a sound, which was like different limbs were striking it. So it was pretty defined. Someone is on the other side noise, and not just the normal creaks and pops of an old New England home. This happened during any time of the day or night. One evening, it just kept happening over and over, like someone was trying to break their way into my room. I made my dad check it out while I stood behind to see, and there was nothing. He closed it up, locked the door, and went about his business. Then it started again, quietly at first, then building up to loud crashes. Had dad check again, again, nothing there. I have no idea what it was, but it was freaky as hell. In the same house, there were lots of little things which I'm sure had more to do with being a freaked out kid than anything else. I had many instances of terrible sleep paralysis where I could feel something grabbing lightly at my feet and or pushing on my belly and chest. I would often see cat's skirt 
about my feet or around doorways when there was no cat there. I would hear angry, indecipherable whispers when sleeping in the living room, etc. Creepy old house. During the same period, but this was my friend's house. She lived in a two-family home on the top floor. They had a shared attic with a stairway up to it, which was next to her room. Her downstairs neighbor was an elderly woman, and she lived there for many years. After she died, we would often hear very human-sounding footsteps in the attic, but not going up the stairs behind her room to the attic, which were normally very audible. When I was pregnant with my first child, we lived in a small house in New Mexico. One day, I'm sitting on the computer, surprise, and our dog starts barking in the yard. So I turn around and look out the window. As I do this, I see what I think is our dog walk from the front door, past the couch, and into the bedroom. Only then I realized that our bedroom door is closed and our dog is outside. This one freaks me out a bit as I was an adult when it happened, but there were also easy explanations for this sort of thing. It was still freaky. A few years ago, we were living in a new home in Texas. I'm home alone with the kids and my husband was out of town for work. It's the middle of the day, so I wasn't actually freaked out. Then, Something bangs on the house from the outside. Not unusual. Could be anything. Then it happens again on the other side. Then the back door. It keeps going around the house in circles and gets faster. It was way too quick for it to have been something running circles around the house. I finally, I say finally, but this all happened in a matter of less than a minute got the nerve to open the back door and look. And of course, there's nothing there. It stopped after I looked, gave me a pit in my stomach. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Just remembered some other things from my house in New Mexico. My daughter, as a baby, would stare at this one blank corner of the wall and react as if someone were playing with her. She would giggle, make different faces, and babble at the wall. I was not a huge fan. Our dog also used to react to seemingly nothing. She would whine randomly at the wall between the bedrooms, which was made of solid cement, so it's not as if somebody was living in it. She would also refuse to enter the second bedroom, even though she was allowed. She'd just stand at the entrance and whine and do the little doggy, I want to do it, but I don't want to do it alone, dance. She didn't like me and the baby to go in there either and would follow nervously until we went in there, then bark at me in a concerned manner until we left. She wasn't normally the type of dog to follow you around. Some of my previous stories regarding my experience doing crime scene cleanup work or trauma scene work, as we call it, generated a lot of people messaging me, asking me to write up more stories from that. I used to do this work in the early 1990s and ran into all kinds of situations such as accidental deaths, suicide, fire deaths, explosions, homicides, unattended deaths, and pretty much any messy situation that could happen inside of a home or a structure. This was the first time I ever saw an elevator in a home. I never met the homeowner or actually any representative from the person who owned the home, as all of the paperwork was done via fax. I think it was owned by an Asian family, but couldn't be 100% sure. I only thought this at the time due to the furnishings and stuff inside the home. The home was pretty much emptied out of most of the personal contents prior to our arrival, so I didn't see any family photos on the walls. The home was so huge that you could get lost inside of it. Up to this point, I had never been inside 
A multi-level home, much less one with so many bedrooms, game room, indoor pool, bar, dens, family rooms, basements, and I think a six-car garage if I remember correctly. Anyway, we started work on this one really late in the evening. It was once a crime scene, but by the time it was released to us, there was other damages that I could not explain. I assumed that the person was killed in the master bathroom, as there was some signs of trauma and some bullet holes in the bathroom shower and surrounding walls. Not much blood, and that kind of stuff is easy to clean up, as I think the person must have died in a huge walk-in shower. What was odd was that I don't know if the shooter turned on all the water faucets in the house because there was water damage all throughout the house. Kind of like Home Alone wet bandits type of stuff. There were areas where we had to remove wet drywall, wet carpet, baseboards, wood flooring, wet ceilings and cabinets. Since this was all over this huge house, my crew at the time were just about five of us. We split up doing different areas. This house was so big that you couldn't hear each other from different areas, even if you were screaming. But we all carried this old Motorola walkie-talkies that we could call and communicate with each other for miles. One of the issues we were dealing with was that in certain areas of the house, the lights were off. I think prior to us coming out, an electrician shut off the power in different areas because electrical components could get wet. We all decided that using the elevator was not a good idea, and we just used the stairs and walking through the different areas of the home was completely dark. We thought about using our generator, but the house was too big and there were so many rooms, so we just ran extension cords with lights to the areas we needed, but still didn't light up enough of the house. I remember two of our guys were working on the upstairs, I think. You could call it the third or fourth floor. The area where the murder took place, another guy was working by himself in what looked like a bar, indoor nightclub area, removing wet cabinets and flooring. Another guy was working on this huge walk-in closet, tearing out wet carpet and drywall from floor to ceiling. I started working in a basement area. There was some ceiling and walls that needed to be removed. This job was going to be an all-nighter because of the vast areas and multiple areas that all the damage was, and we kept finding more and more of it. Also, everything that we removed that was damaged was a long trek to take it out of the house and down the drive to our trucks, adding to the time it took. So, why is this a scary or creepy story? Well, imagine being in this huge home where a murder took place, for once. But, as we got on through the night working, we started hearing and experiencing things. Our old radios would do a beep beep chime when someone was about to say something over the air. Since it was only our company that had these radios, it wasn't random interference from outside sources, and we hadn't experienced such things before. But as the night went on and we were working, we kept getting alerts that someone was about to talk, so I and the others would drop what we were doing and listen for after the beep beep like for someone to say something, but no one spoke. Okay, so maybe the guys were fooling around with the radios. I was making my way with a trash can of debris out of the basement, as I didn't want to make my trash too heavy to carry out. I made several loads, and it was a summer night, so getting out in the cool summer air was also a benefit. One of those trips, I had to go up the stairs from the basement, and down a long hallway. I believe to my right was an opening to a large living room type room, and to my left was some windows to the outside, but further down was the door that I needed to take to exit and take my debris out. One of these trips, the lights all went out. I got some light from the moon outside, but to my right, the rest of the house seemed unnaturally dark. As I make my way back to the truck, I grabbed a small flashlight, just in case this happens again. 
After a while of working, the basement area, one of the guys comes up to me and starts chatting. I can tell he's nervous, and he starts on me, saying, wouldn't it be better if we work together? That way we can finish up areas quicker. I could tell he didn't want to be by himself, so I agreed, and honestly, I knew how he felt. At about 1 a.m., we all decided to take a break and meet in the pool table room and eat and take a break. We started exchanging stories about the place, mostly on how cool it was, but also on how creepy it was. And we all experienced random whole sections of the house losing power, only for it to come back on again. Then a different section. The guys that were on the upstairs part talked about hearing music but couldn't find the source. I brought up who is the dumbass who keeps hitting the talk button. No one did. We started coming to the realization that this job wasn't going to be completed tonight and it would be a two or three day job instead. We talked about our options and one of them was since it was nearly two at that point, we should work a few more hours and sleep there and get up and go shower and go back to our office. I, for one, wasn't into the idea of sleeping in that house and overruled and said, we will work a couple more hours, then call it a day. The following day, we already had another job on the books, so we got home and rested a little, then back at it. We got back to the big fancy house at 3 p.m and decided to work as long as we could, then finish it up the following day. That evening, we sent one of the guys for pizza, and we kept working, so there were two of us paired up, and when the pizza came, we would take a break, eat, and rest up a bit, then get back to it. I know this is drawn out, but for the things that happened next to this day, I am not sure if it was being super tired and sleep-deprived or if something else was going on inside that house. After we ate our dinner, and once again back into the pool table room, we are just relaxing as the work and distances in the house were taking a toll on us. We decide the best case so no one of us gets too tired lugging the trash is we would split that duty. One guy will go, then come back, and another guy would go, and come back, and so on. Almost everyone hears music playing at the same point in the house. I heard it walking down the kitchen area to that long hallway, but it sounded like it was coming from another location in the house. Another guy heard it coming from upstairs in the master bedroom area, but when you got up there, it sounded like it was somewhere else. Okay, just music, no big deal. One of our guys called us over to the radio, as he was making his way back from taking debris out to the trucks and said, Hey, was someone here in the kitchen pantry room? We were all saying no and asking why. He said, The door's open and it wasn't before. We joked with him that he was probably hungry. It was about midnight at this point and I was working in one of the extra bedrooms that had its own private bathroom. This area was down a long hallway that had a few other rooms and ended into a den-type area. I was with one of my guys, and we both jumped as we heard a loud bang. It sounded like something big and flat hit the ground, kind of like if you knocked over a large piece of furniture, and I got on the radio and checked on my guys, thinking they broke something. And everyone said, no that they hadn't broke anything, and no one else heard it. My coworker and I sure did, so we go down the hallway and look around. Maybe a picture fell from the wall or something fell over. Nothing. One of the last trips from that area, my coworker took the debris to the truck, and I was left alone in the room waiting for him to return, and the lights go out. I am sitting here in this room, in the dark. All down the hallway is pitch dark for some reason. Not even enough light from the moon. He took our flashlight with him. I start to make my way out of the room going down to the den area 
that led to a larger open room, then from there to a living room and dining room, then on to the kitchen, and I start to see light from the pool table room. So I start to make my way over there, then those lights go out. I get on my radio and call out that all the lights on the second floor just went out. I start to hear someone walking towards me, coming from the living room area, and thinking it was my coworker, I call out to him and didn't get a response. I stood there in silence. Then I start to see a flashlight moving around, and it's another coworker. He said that in his area, the lights were on and heard me yelling at him. I didn't yell. I only had called on the radio. Just as we were talking, the lights came back on. My coworker with the trash can and the flashlight comes back in. The last and final day we go out to finish, I canceled our schedule so that we could finish the job in the light of day. No more evenings or middle of the night working or being in that house. After we were all done, we started exchanging stories about it. And one guy said that he swears he heard me yell for him. I promise I didn't. Probably because I was frozen. The lights turning off and on was everywhere. It wasn't like an electrical issue, but someone messing with us. One guy said he went to use one of the only functioning restrooms and had seen someone walk by when he opened the door, and it wasn't one of us. One of our guys claimed he heard footsteps in another room. We all heard the music, and one thing about the music is we all heard a different type. I hear what sounded like classical music, like Chopin or Mozart. Another one said it sounded like country music, but he couldn't make out the lyrics. And yet another heard what sounded like to him the Macarena, or something you would hear in a Mexican restaurant. We were all just like, what the fuck was all of that about? A few more hours went by, and we were done with the home. It was finally time for us to go home. As we were all pulling out, I just so happened to turn and look at the home and saw two shadow figures standing in the window. This story happened three years ago when I was 15 in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think I am making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week, and I want people to know about it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in the area is quite difficult nowadays, since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there, and my favorite thing was going hiking, although I had never gone alone into the woods, just the roads with people. My grandma had told me that cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that has been covered in brush and trees over the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared. Like runners and stuff, I think. Usually, I'd go to the nearest town, one hour away by foot, by the only way I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path my granny said was safe alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally had to climb up four legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. 
This part was plain floor, where the woods usually begin. So it was a relief until I got down to the dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seems really off to me because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Aside those trees, there's a little barn. Yes, a barn. In the middle of the woods, I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. I mean, it looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and then I crossed the fence. I crossed it, running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees in it. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental. How there casually was a barn with a clear field when that path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off to me. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill my grandma had described. The one that connected with the village. Suddenly, there was a silence moment in the woods, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was a bird or something, but they came closer. They really sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably an animal, I was just so afraid I couldn't look back. I started walking faster. Guess what? So did the footsteps. I just started running after noticing that, and so did the footsteps again. I was running for my life at this point. Suddenly, I started hearing incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got into the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house. No need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back and then came back home. I get chills just from remembering this place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere and the grunt. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into those woods alone, ever after that. Hello everyone, I was listening to a podcast about ghost stories and I thought I'd share a few experiences I had in my childhood home. The house where I grew up is over a hundred years old and my parents still live there. My dad has actually lived in that house his entire life and my grandparents built out the attic space into two additional bedrooms when he was a kid. The back bedroom of the upstairs was the room my sister and I shared when we were kids and is directly above our living room. There have been so many times when I would be alone in the house and in the living room when there would be a crashing sound coming from upstairs in our room. Think someone dropping a stack of books. I'd run upstairs, but nothing was ever out of place. I didn't say anything for years because I figured no one would believe me anyway. When I eventually told my mom and sister, they looked kind of shocked but both admitted they'd also been hearing the same noise for years. When I was 16, I was playing Super Mario World in the alcove of my bedroom. I was facing the window with my back to the rest of the room. When you start a level in the game, the screen kind of fades to black for maybe a second or two. When this happened, I could see the reflection of a man standing behind me. Thinking it was my dad, I whipped around to ask how he managed to sneak up the stairs. That's because the stairs creak like crazy. But there was no one there. I reset the console over and over again, but the man was gone. 
I told my dad what I had seen, and he seemed a little spooked before he told me that I had described his father who died before I was born. After that, he refused to acknowledge that we ever had that conversation and believed that I was just seeing things. The last big occurrence happened when I was 17. This was before the house had central air, so the summers were spent with windows open to circulate air. I had the front door open, but there was no breeze that day. I was playing on the computer when the front door swung shut and latched. 100-year-old door that has to be latched in a very specific way. I froze when I heard footsteps going from the front door past me and into the kitchen. As the footsteps went past me, I heard the sound of a woman humming. To this day, I still get freaked out when I'm alone in that house even though I know there isn't anything malicious there. And that, dear listeners, is the end of these true, terrifying haunted house stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Mrs. Interscare, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Hattie's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and City Cleveland. Thank you all for continuing to be the support in which Back to Ashes is being held up by. All the other subscribers and listeners, I thank you too. Without any of you, I would not have a voice. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.